sing glory! It's weird how corporeality and the spirit are inextricably linked. Trying to carve out our own little space is this equilibrium of infusing the concrete here and now with the slippery intangibility of the soul. It gets even weirder when we start thinking in terms of relationships, jobs, and the utter technicalities of it all. Fashion designer and founder of the label Pumpamoos, Danica Zheng, recently made the announcement to give the brand a clean restart. She's a mother who's questioning the security of a world in which her child will grow up in, a designer who's confronted the ethicality of the practice, and a person who's looking to give a little more of herself, not in terms of the amount of pieces produced, collections picked up, or fashion weeks checked off the list, but rather what her designs could mean in terms of sustainability, ethicality, community, and her own spirit as a designer. I love this episode as it brings into question the true relationship we have with the constant need to consume, how we're seeing this play out in the world around us, and on a deeper level, the way it's making us feel. This is Pomplemousse with Danica Jang. A quick heads up, we're dealing with an overseas conversation here, so the audio may reflect this. Coming to you from New York City in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I... I think I am quite calm as a person in general. <laughs> uh, usually quite chill and yeah, just um, kind of like to go with the flow of things. But I do um, try to, you know, think on uh, when I before I make a decision or anything. I, I like to think a lot about it. Um, kind of just put it at the back of my head and just keep going through it uh, before I jump into doing anything at the end. And how does your your intuition and gut play into this? What does that look like? I don't want to confuse intuition with, uh, I suppose, impulses, but I feel like kind of with age you become um, more confident, um, with your intuition, but also I feel like I would think through a lot more than before. So I, I feel like I'm quite an intuitive person, but I definitely used to be a lot more impulsive <laughs> than I am now. As as I get older, like um, before I jump into any conclusions or making any decisions, um, there would be definitely you know moments when you feel like this might be the right thing to do, this might be the right direction to go, but um, Instead of just jumping right into it, I would always give myself a little more time to just, you know, think through everything and uh, let it just kind of sleep on it and see how I feel after after I have a, after I have an idea or a thought. Um, maybe you know, give it a few days, give it a few weeks, and if I still feel like this is what I want to do, this is the right direction to go, then I would follow that. Um, instead of, you know, when I was younger, I suppose, like, I want to get a tattoo tomorrow, I'm going to call up a tattoo artist and, <laughs> and um, just kind of jump right. I, I guess that's, like, impulses you know, as opposed to intuition. Yeah. Would you say that going off of your impulses yeah. was definitely a contributing factor in getting in touch with that side of yourself? Yeah, for sure. It kind of helps uh, me to learn better about myself as... Um, you know who I am as a person, what I what I, I I like to do, or if I make mistakes, by uh, jumping into my impulses. You just it's I get I'm sure it's part of the you know the growing up, the maturing, and all that. Yeah, and Pumple Moose. First off, I just yeah. I love the name. Ah, oh, I love saying <laughs> it. But yeah, so if you could speak a little to Pumple Moose and the founding of it and your background and how it came to be. Yeah, so I founded Pomplemousse about four years ago and it was a time when I felt that I wanted a little bit of change um, to what I see and I wish I could do something to make a difference in a way to, um, you know, to what kind of products that people are getting out in the market, uh, the price point and everything. Because uh, right now we, we just you know, started going in a much more... Um, sustainable direction but back then I didn't have that um, 
idea, more like, you know, I, I, I think I couldn't, me working as a designer, I was working at Kevin Klein collection, um, but I couldn't afford what I was designing, uh, which I thought that was a problem in a way. Um, so I wanted to make something that's designer, but at the same time, a little more affordable to the mass and just a little more fun and kind of speaks to people, um, I guess, I am as a designer. <laughs> We connected over your recent announcement regarding Pomplemousse and the direction you're looking to take the brand in. And since it's founding, uh -huh. you've kept manufacturing local within New York, am I right? Uh -huh. yeah. And you have sourced fabrics that are more natural in their makeup, such as cotton and silk and wool. But with regards to ethicality and sustainability, has this always been something with which you've navigated the brand's direction with? Um, I think it was kind of a natural part of my design process when I was choosing fabrics, when I was doing manufacturing. It, uh, it just right from the beginning, I always thought, um, you know, I want to use more organic materials just because I felt that's a more responsible thing to do. Designer, um, I don't want to adopt products that could in any ways be um, less than what I could offer in terms of quality and design. So I think it came not, at the beginning, not, um, you know, like I didn't have that mission thinking, oh my God, I want to make a sustainable brand that has to be really picky about materials, anything. It just came naturally. Like I wanted out the best product um, I could and I want to source the best fabrics I could um, just, cause, just because <laughs> I yeah. feel responsible as a designer to give the best to the customers. And then I think over the past few years in the industry, there was a lot more talk about uh, the importance of sustainability. And then also, you know, with me, my own personal life, I, I had a baby a few, uh, about nine months ago. And that also kind of shifted my priorities to rethink what more I can do as a designer, what more can the brand do um, to, in a way, help uh, to educate or influence um, people more about the way they dress, the way they shop, um, and how designers kind of put products out there. So instead of just taking that, you know, the initial uh, idea of picking the best products, I started thinking about what, like, what is the next step for that, uh, and how, how we should really put out, in a way, less products because before um, the collection was, the brand was following a very traditional calendar of you know, putting out collections and showing to buyers. And a lot of things actually go to waste. Not every single piece get picked up. And the other samples that's, to me, I felt that was very uh, wasteful in terms of resources and energy. And, um, and also because of the number of products that I used to put out uh, it makes me have less time to focus on each individual piece um yeah so that's why i decided to change the direction and if you're comfortable with sharing while you were working to meet the demands of the fashion industry's traditional calendar how were you seeing this contribute mm -hmm. to your own waste where was the bulk of the waste coming from and how how did you kind of go about handling that waste so each season we make a lot of samples just to, in a way, make up a number uh, um, because it's what we're used to doing. Uh, a lot of times buyers want to see a larger collection and it somewhat is an indication of how prepared uh, you are as a designer to be able to put up a full, uh, so-called full, complete collection. But Eventually, not every single piece get produced, and in a way, that's that to me was a bit of a waste of resources because we we spend and the the pieces we're showing to buyers that's not just uh, what we actually make. Sometimes we make way more, and then we end up um, some some of the pieces we might not end up uh, using uh, or showing at all. So at the end of the day, it's about. 10, 15 styles out of maybe 50, 60 styles produced every season um, just to um, just to kind of tell a story about the brand. 
And also, I think in terms of sales after production, because we have we have been every single. I mean, there are so many designers. There's so many brands out there. We are putting out so much products out every season. Not everything gets appreciated as much as they should. In a way, I think have a much stronger purpose. And everybody, when shopping, it should be a very Conscious decision behind every single purchase we make. Instead of,、um, I mean, it's a result of. I can I can go on for days about this. But no, I love it. Of, I love it. You know everything like, in, <laughs>、um, like influencer culture because we see young influencers putting out. You know they they are wearing new things all the time, and so a lot of young people today they feel that this is. Uh, what they want, and this is how things should be. A lot of us don't want to be seen wearing the same thing twice, and so it all contributes to、um, this this whole. It, it's it's all it's all part of the problem. But yeah, there are a lot of fast fashion brands out there, and、um, they are、um, you know producing a ton of stuff, and they are readily available、um, at very very affordable prices. And that obviously aggregated、um, to the problem, and I think it's actually what changed a lot of people's、uh, shopping habits because we felt that we could wear new things all, all the time, and we could、uh, we are able to afford to look, you know, to have a different look、uh, every day. Or Shiny and new all the time. Yeah. And you're, I mean, you're working to meet these demands. What was that? What's that pressure like on? The creative aspect of it, and actually keeping that source of inspiration, and yes, this is your passion. Keeping that it's sacred and keeping that safe, and not overworking that because you don't want to be a machine at the end of the day, and you still want to deliver designs that are going to speak to your customer. So, what what did that balance look like? You have to be. I think towards the end, I was. Uh, making decisions a lot quicker than I、uh, when I first started out designing.、Um, it's almost like a bit of a system where you think, okay, this is going to be、uh, the new color palettes.、So、I would choose maybe three or four colors, and、uh, then this is what we're going to focus on: what pattern, what styles, and we just churn out pieces. And usually, to I was feeling a little.、Um, You know, every time when we do a photo shoot, I would feel very excited about the pieces when I just see them, because I guess during the photo shoot, it's also、um, it, it's the first time for me to see a whole collection coming together,、um, and you know, with like a complete with a model with makeup, hair, everything done.、Um, but and usually right after the photo shoot, I felt ama- amazing. I felt very excited about the collection, but after you look at it、uh, for You know, at the end of the photo shoot, after you pick all the photos, after you print the lookbook, and I always felt like, okay,、um, the more you look at it, the more, the less I would like it. I think because I also had that,、um, you know, different、uh, habit of just always thinking about the next thing. So. A lot of times after、um, a collection, maybe a couple of weeks after, by the time I'm showing it to the buyers, I'm already a little. I've already lost a bit of interest in that、uh, particular collection, and I'm already thinking about, oh, what I'm going to be designing for the next event. So in the end, it was a little bit of a problem. I felt because I want to love the pieces that I make for as long as possible. I think every single、uh, every every design should be much more long lasting, and if I am as a designer not loving them for a long time, then I I don't I don't know how the customer is gonna、uh, want or love that piece. You know, it's technically the same as on the other side of the spectrum where the consumer doesn't have that long standing appreciation for the piece. They're already thinking about the next thing, and then. You see designers as well behind the brands; they've already kind of lost that spark for it, and this, yeah, the mentality that goes into、mm-hmm. these clothes is completely reflected on both spectrums.、Um, but working under、yeah. the industry's long-standing schedule of seasonal collections and 
showings and markdowns. Um, and the, this just leads to, as you said, an excess in material overstock where inventory is concerned. And not to, not to mention our climate change as well. I'm still wearing, I'm decked out in sweaters sometimes, and I'm seeing spring collection campaigns around me. Um, but with this in mind, yeah. yeah, how are you looking to scale the business from here and out? Because you're still competing with an industry that as a whole hasn't quite made that transition yet. And they're, yeah, they're not adopting full-on sustainable approaches and especially during markdown period as well. How do you see that going forwards? Yes. The first step of the transition, we are making it direct to consumer and that would help us a lot to um, kind of compete uh, in terms of pricing um, because to not have that um, wholesale to retail kind of markup, which is a lot more than if we are able to offer the same product to directly to customers. Um, uh, so that's that's the first step. But in the end, Pumpkin is a really it's a small brand at the moment, and we just want to do what um, we think is right at the moment to make sure that uh, we figure out this system of you know putting out meaningful products at um, at a pace that we're comfortable at, and using the best materials and uh, the most responsible production process and working with different communities um, that are um, in a way that we feel is uh, has a story to tell or is meaningful is a meaningful collaboration and the main goal right now is to relay a message to people who are following Pampumus at the moment who might be interested in the topic that um, there could be a change, and even though it might be small at the moment, it uh, you know it takes one person to tell the next and to next, and that's how things grow, and that's how um, things progress. Yeah, got to plant the seed. <laughs> yeah. And moving forwards with regards to collections, do you want to stay somewhat intentional with the seasons in mind and rotate releases this way, or? Would you be looking to create more staple pieces such as yeah, basics and maybe branch out to a core collection that's more applicable during all seasons? Having a core collection is definitely something that we are moving towards. Uh, but of course, we'll always be mindful of the seasons before um, putting up products. Um, it would just be much more focused, much more... Um, it's It would be a smaller... I wouldn't. I wouldn't even say collection. We will be putting out individual pieces at, at uh, just at different times, um, but be mindful of seasons. And during Fashion Week, the fa- the Fashion Week, mm-hmm. um, a lot of designers are leaning more towards doing presentations. And do you see Pumple Moose still being somewhat involved in this way, or are you looking to forgo? the calendar completely um fashion week <laughs> it's it's an interesting time um you know during fashion week because there's a lot going on and, and sometimes i think we in a way sometimes i always want to be part of that conversation but upon request i've left this part of the conversation out due to the nature of the subject Fashion is still very much a sensitive topic and is a space, whether we're directly involved in it or not, that we must all share. Hopefully in light of all that Danica has shared and the sheer transparency with which she's done so has got you thinking on your own relationship with what's in your closet, the shoes beneath your bed, and even just the objects that make up your daily environment. What impact have they had? Whose lives have they touched? And what is it bringing to yours? (laughs) And you are releasing the indigo sweats which i saw recently on instagram they look amazing congratulations Um, thank you and (laughs) if you're working with traditional artisans in is it i'm not exactly sure of the pronunciation guizhou 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 okay guizhou guizhou china they are organic cotton sweatshirts that are hand dyed with the natural plant dye deriving from the indigo grass Mm -hmm. and 
I mean, it's crazy that I, as a consumer on one side of the world, can buy this, and it's a part of it is it originates from a place such as Guizhou, where it plays a part in supporting craft and tradition and community, and that capitalism has, yeah, it's it's seen to so much wrong, and that now as we're evolving as a humanity, we're learning to kind of flip that switch and create partnerships and bridging this new world with the old and finding this balance between both sides of the spectrum and I really want to know that how by dedicating Pomplemousse to ethical and sustainable practices what further doors this has opened the methods and maybe new ideas that you've been introduced to and just what you're excited about going forwards. I am very interested in in, um, how, in textile, um, how uh, it, textile could be a combination of uh, innovative uh, technology, but at the same time, keeping that uh, traditional techniques alive. So this indigo sweatshirt is the first product that we will be releasing uh, after I got connected to uh, someone who represents the villages from uh, who, who practice this uh, traditional indigo dye method in Guizhou. And there are actually a lot of other villages um, from different parts of China that um, they, they, they have, have actually been practicing this. And there's so much you can do about it. it the color of it is, comes out beautiful. It's organic. It's completely uh, has zero impact on the environment. They, the villagers, they they cut um, grass from a mountain that's near their home, and then they extract the dye and they actually do it, you know, where um, in the river. So it's it's a completely natural process. And we've also been introduced to um, some other factories where, uh, like a Japanese factory that still preserves their traditional uh, weaving technique, the Japanese traditional weaving technique, but using the most uh, advanced technology for uh, textile at the moment. And that's going to be the next product to be released very soon. So it's getting into this really helps me uh, just to connect with different factories and different technology and and it's like it's it's eye opening to see how um, people are like what what people are doing right now instead of just focusing on you know producing more pieces for the next collection using readily available fabrics in a way. And stepping away from pomplums for a little bit, as a mother, have you thought maybe about children's designs? Yes, we actually. Actually, the indigo sweatshirt is also going to be available in uh, children's sizing. So we will be releasing certain products with, uh, you know, matching like family sets, uh, family sizing. So that's very exciting. I can't wait to see my daughter wearing one of them. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I can only imagine that as a parent, you really don't want to have any of those dyes or like those those the chemicals on your child on your children's skin and it's really terrifying when you see the labels and what's actually going into so much of what children touch and how the skin absorbs all of that so i think this this is absolutely wonderful i'm really excited to see this um (laughs) and i feel you'd be a great resource as well and maybe giving some recommendations to already sustainable and ethical brands that you yourself may use in dressing your daughter? Do you have any of your, do you have any favorites, any go-tos or does she have any favorites? There are actually a lot of uh, interesting brands out there. I mean, one of the pioneers um, is obviously Elaine Fisher. They have been doing this for the longest time. And then Patagonia, it's another brand that I love. It might be uh, quite specific in, ter- uh, in the styles because it's mostly like mountain climbing gear. But they have an amazing program where you could, they recycle everything you use. You can upcycle it. You can um, bring it back into the store, uh, to, to the company to have, you know, if you have like any parts of the, of the clothing uh, damaged, you can have it fixed instead of, you know, uh, I'm sure some... 
sometimes we we have certain parts that that's like a zipper that's broken we we don't know what to do about it anymore so we just throw it out you know which is very wasteful <laughs> so with patagonia they would help to fix all that and there is a new brand a new company called pangaya uh which i've been following it's amazing they have you know t-shirt that's made from uh, seaweed extract fibers there is a lot of very innovative technology in the textile they use and they use vegan dye as well there are actually a lot of companies brands out there doing a lot um at, at the moment and Obviously, you know, secondhand shopping is it's always helpful. There are a lot of vintage stores and online consignment stores where you can get things off secondhand and they're in great condition. If we are mindful to this, if we look, there are a lot of options. And since having made this transition and the announcement, have you found that the Pamplemousse community, what what kind of feedback have you seen so far? And is there an open dialogue between the brand and its customers on these subjects? Yeah, we've received a lot of really positive、uh, comments. People are very excited about this new direction, and it makes a lot of sense to、um, to a lot of people. I think、um, sometimes if I if I talk to some of my friends. They they would have the question, you know, if I talk about sustainable fashion, they might ask me what is, what exactly is it? Like I I want to do more. I I would love to shop more sustainably, but how how do I do it? Because sometimes that information is not readily available for everyone, and sometimes you just if we I guess if someone is not in the fashion industry, they just They don't have that information, so I think one of the main、uh, goal right now is to tell people more about what exactly it is and how it's really not that intimidating. It's not like something like, do I have to have a certain look if I want to dress sustainable?、Uh, do I need to only be wearing really boring things if I want to, if I want to be mindful of what I, how I shop? It's the answer is no, and this is what we. We want to tell people. <laughs> yeah, I feel like so many people they have this image of if I'm going to go sustainable and ethical, I'm gonna look like a hippie, essentially. But there's so much out there. There is, yes. And in closing, if you could give an example of a time in your life where it was guts versus logic, and you went with your gut, and how this played out, aside from this recent. Massive shift. <laughs> um, I think it's when I went to Parsons actually, because、um, after I graduated from high school, I actually went to. I always thought I was going to do architecture. So I actually went to USC for a semester of architecture, and my whole family they they at the beginning they didn't really. Uh, my parents were like, "What is fashion? Like, it's not going to be stable. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do fashion design. Like,、um, you should definitely do architecture."、Um, so after I went to USC for architecture for a semester, I decided to transfer, kind of without really,、uh, you know, asking my parents for their permission in a way. Like, I just did it,、um, and I moved to New York. I went to Harvard. I guess that's the most life-changing. Experience or decision that I've made, it was worth it. Definitely, yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, <laughs> it felt right. This is Guts and Glory signing off with Danica Jang. This was Pamplemousse with Danica Jang. Refer to the show notes to further get to know our guest. Share your thoughts and show us some love by subscribing or getting touched to be featured on the podcast. Released every other Monday. Thanks for lending us an ear. Passing on the mic. 